making your home work, not homework, like, like Richard said earlier. But that's what we're going to look at this morning. And we're going we're gonna to look at who God says you should marry. Has God picked out somebody to be your mate before you're married? We're going to look at that briefly. We're going to also look at uh, some of the problems that you and I have in marriage. And more importantly, we're going to look at the cause of those problems that you and I have in our marriages. And then, of course, we're going to look at some answers for those problems that we have. So it's, it's a study of the vital importance of the home, marriage, and family to the work of the ministry and the necessity of a grace-oiled home life. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, and uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Those are going to be our text, our text verses. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. You know, my... Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, down through 6, 1 through 4 is what we're going to read. You know, Steve mentioned that he always hoped he had a lot of a long verses, so he had a lot of stuff. Well, Steve, I got it. I got a lot of verses in, in there to cover. And we won't be able to cover it all, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover a little bit of it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, for it is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things and to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. But no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Look at uh, Colossians there with me, if you would. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Look at that for just a minute. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that again this morning for the opportunity to be here and to look into your word. We pray, Lord, for open minds and open hearts that we could glean something this morning from your word for our families, which is the, the most important thing in our lives, to, to, ha to have that grace-oiled family, to, to continue to to uh, go into the local assembly and, and serve you and serve one another. We thank you for that.
Thank you for each one that's here again today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, those are, those are some long passages and some long words and long verses. But before we get started, I want to look at those first two verses in each of those passages and address that just briefly. There in Ephesians chapter 5, that first verse, in verse 18 says, And be not, be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It's a good question, isn't it? If that's what you're, you're admonished to do is to be filled with the Spirit, what is that? Now, a real good hint is, is the, uh, the, the sister verse over here in Colossians that we read in verse 16. Watch this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So you have the verses there, they're, they're, they're sister brother verses there, that are teaching the same thing. So to be filled with the Spirit, Spirit, it's obviously is to be filled with the Word of God. You see that? See it in Colossians there? And the results, as you go down through there, are the same. It's the information concerning marriage and the family. So to be filled with the Spirit today in the dispensation of grace is to be filled with God's Word. Okay? It wasn't like that in time past. In time past there, when God was dealing with the nation of Israel in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, God supernaturally filled them with the Spirit, did He not? In order that they could do something that He had told them to do, to go in all the world and preach the gospel. So God filled them with the Spirit, which enabled them to speak in what? Foreign tongues. So that so that they could go into all, all the world and preach the gospel, and they could speak the tongues and the people could understand them, so that they could fulfill their, com- their, their commission. But they, that's not what it is today. Those things change. That's why it's, un- it's important to understand how to rightly divide your word of God and know that God did things different in time past when he's dealing with Israel than things are today. So uh, just wanted to start with that. Now I've got a question for you as we begin here with, with our message. When did your family begin? Do you ever think about that? The, your family, if you're, if you're married, you've got children and your wife. When did that actually begin? I was thinking about that. And you know, God gives the uh, institutions for marriage. How many are they? Volition? Come on. Volition, marriage, family, and then nationalism, isn't it? So I believe that your family started... Before you got married. Because what did you do before you got married? Here. You used volition in choosing a mate. Whether it be a wife or a husband. So I believe the first thing that's, that began your family was your choice that you made. Your volition. But there was something before that. Before you chose a mate. Where you exercised volition. And what was that? That was your salvation. You exercise volition to choose whether or not you was going to believe the gospel and get saved. That was the first thing that you did. Did that affect your family? Will that affect your family if you're a young person listening? Absolutely will. If you're a saved individual, that's going to affect or should affect who it is that you're going to marry. Right? Now... I think someone else mentioned this earlier, but knowing that information, knowing who you should marry and why you should marry them according to scriptures, that's knowledge. And someone else said, knowledge is of no value without the wisdom to apply it to your life. That's very important. Doesn't do you any good to know these things if you're not applying them to your life, if you're not applying them to your to your marriage, if you're not applying them to, does no good to know that you're you're supposed to marry a, someone that's in the Lord, someone saved. And then you come and say, "Well, I know it says that, but you, you know, I just really like this person, and they just that's been disobedient to God's word. It's not wisdom. It's not wisdom. Okay, you should not allow yourself, young people, to get involved with someone like that." 
Okay? It's not good. Now, you can be a whole person without marriage, without being married. But if you choose to get married, you must follow God's instructions. Or you're, it's not going to turn out well for you most of the time. It's not going to turn out well for you. You know, a uh, statistic show that the majority of prisons, you know who they're filled with? Men without strong father figures. That's who they're filled with. The majority of them. Without strong father figures. That, that term, baby daddy. Have you heard that term? You know, we chuckle at that. But I hate that. You know? I think God hates that term. Homes need dads. Today, probably more than ever, because there's an assault, I believe, on marriage and homes. Okay? And homes need their dads. It's the most important thing. Not the most important. It's important to have a strong father figure in that home. He needs to be there. He, knows, he needs to understand the Word of God. And he needs to be able to teach that to those children so that they can understand it. We had last Father's Day. We always have a big get-together. And we come up with the ideal of, okay, let's, everybody, there were, I think the youngest one that participated in this was eight year, seven years old. And we had them, okay, everybody write down the most important things for a father. We have, we have a big family, and we have a lot, a lot of adults there, you know, my children and grandchildren, adults, and, and so on and so forth. And, all the, and they wrote down the three most important things for a father at one of our gatherings. Now, it's, it's really not that important what they wrote. What's important is we read all the things that everybody wrote. And that was a great, great experiment. Because if you wrote down the wrong answer... Chances are you was a lesson to see what everybody else wrote down. And there was a lot of good answers written down there. So that, that, that's just something that, that, we did, that we did. Turn with me. Uh, what does Colossians 3, 16 says? Let the word of Christ dwell in you, what? Richly. It's really supposed to be, you're supposed to be filled with the word of God. And that, as we go through these verses... You need to have them fill up inside of you. Okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Anybody remembers what that says? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, It's not good for man to be alone. Can I get an amen from any man out there? <laughs> I'm helpless most of the time. I'm going to tell you, it wouldn't be good if I was alone. <laughs> my, my wife would tell you the same thing. I need help. And if I have a helpmate, and I need help badly. And if you're like me, thank you. If you're like me, you need help. And if you don't know it, ask your wife and she'll tell you you need help. <laughs> I'll guarantee it. It's not... <laughs> Thank you, sis. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says, The man is to leave the father and mother. Remember that? And he's to be that new male leadership in a new home. In the beginning of the man. He's not supposed to be no mama's boy. Okay? He's to be that strong male spiritual leader in, in, in setting up that new family, okay? That male leader of a new family unit. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, let, let's turn there real quick. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. This, this is kind of important here. From We're going to look at it maybe from a different standpoint than, than you really usually look at it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That one flesh, when you get married, young people, when you get married, 
you have a new identity that you never had before. That's completely different than the identity that you had before. Because for the first X number of years of your life, it's always been me. It's always been I. But when you get married, it's no longer me. It's no longer I. What is it? It's we. It's us. Our name is Mr. and Mrs. Carl Hayes. That's who we are. That's what we are. We're an entity. We're two people, see? We're on the same team. One of us can't win without the other one winning. One of us can't lose without the other losing. And when you try to do that, you're doing the wrong thing. See, you're a team. You're together. It's that oneness of marriage where that singular thinking goes out the window. And it's always us. It's we. And any issue comes up, it's not, it's not what's best for me. Or with the wife, it's not what's, what's best for us. Because we're now a new identity that we have. It's Mr. and Mrs. It's no longer I, we, or just, just that. It's two people, see. Now, another thing, I would, I would advise young people to guard against anyone trying to come between you and your spouse. I'm getting to be an old man. And I've seen that happen. Some of you have seen that. Some of you have experienced it. And that's something that you guard against. Don't let anybody come between your spouse, you and your spouse. She's the most important to you, and he's the most important to you. And don't ever let that happen. And don't ever think that it can happen or won't happen. It might. And just know about it and guard against it. Uh, You know, at times, marriage isn't easy. I've been married all my life, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know if I remember not being... I've been married... Linda and I have been married for 52 years. So we've been married for a day or two. And there's problems in marriages. You're going to have problems in marriage. You know why there's problems in marriages? Because there's a man and a woman. And you know what I've learned? You know what? Men think different than women. Did you know that? If you, if you did not, just know that. Y'all think differently. If you don't, just ask your wife something. And she's going to have a different opinion than you do. Okay? Most of the time. But you think differently. And, and that, that, cause, that can cause problems. But it shouldn't cause problems because it's that difference of, of thinking that makes you, the, the two of you, be better in this world. Okay? You know, you have that old saying, two heads are better than one. I personally believe in a marriage situation, it's a whole lot better. It seems to work out that better. If, if you don't get into the arguing thing and, and all that kind of business, just don't do that. Okay? Now, people come into marriage with all kinds of expectations. You know that? All kinds of unrealistic expectations. They come into marriage and they expect their husband to just make them just so happy of that wife. She's just going to be, be all. And you know what? Doesn't always work. You see, if you have wrong expectations and wrong dependencies on your spouse, you're going to be disappointed. Where are all of your expectations and all your dependencies? Where should all that be filled? In Christ. See, that's what Christ does. Christ does all of that, not your spouse. And when you don't understand that, you're going to come into a marital relationship expecting your spouse to do something that they're not equipped to do and they're not expected and you shouldn't expect them to do that. See, that's where salvation comes in. Before you're, before you're married, you're, you got saved and, 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 and you know all the spiritual blessings that God's done for you. That he, and you, you have to have all that information before you're married, you see. And if you know who you are in Christ, that's going to remove a whole lot of insecurity and a whole lot of dependency 
on someone that can't do what you expect or want them to do. See, God does that. And that's how that, why that's supposed to happen. And once you have that understanding, once you know who you are in Christ and, and you're there, then you can begin to serve one another in your marriage. Okay? And that's what marriage is about. It's about serving one another. It, that's, that's, that's an important thing. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created men and women. God says that he created male and female, right? That's what it says. Now, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 14, turn there briefly if you would. Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. Genesis chapter 19, verse 14. I know you're familiar with all these verses. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-laws, which married his daughters. There's a marriage. Who married who in that verse? The sons-in-law married the daughters. Who did God create in the previous verse we just looked at? Men and women. Think that'll help you a little bit? When you're looking for a spouse... The thing to look for is the, is the opposite sex. I never thought I would ever have to say that. <laughs> to me, that was the most natural thing in the world. But it appears that in today's times, people need to know that. That's what God says. That's what God says. That's what God says, okay? Okay. First uh, Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. We're looking at marriage. And as you begin to think about marriage and, and you get to that stage in life, and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. And we're going at the very end of this verse. The wife is bound by the laws as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. What's those last three words? Only in the Lord. God has two provisions in the Bible for marriage. Do you know what they are? You better know. You better know. God has two provisions in the Bible. It's they have to be the opposite sex and they have to be saved. How do I? That's what God says. That's what God says. Now, if you want to just brush that aside, well, why would anyone not, not do that? Knowing about it is knowledge. What's wisdom? Wisdom is the doing of the information. Not a, lot, not a lot of value in the knowledge if you don't use wisdom and put it into practice, okay? Second uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verse uh, 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You see, God designed order in everything, including marriage. And if you mess it up, chances are it won't work out. Or it could not work out. I mean, either even if you do it right, you're going to have problems. Okay? You're going to have disagreements and arguments either way. So that's just something to, 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 to think about. In the garden, God gave Adam and Eve how many commandments that they had to remember? Just one thing. Just one doggone thing. They didn't have to rightly divide the scripture to nothing. He just told them one thing. <laughs> and you know what? Did they do it? Can you imagine having one thing that you didn't have to do? And they blew it. Big time. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It's an interesting verse. And you wonder why things are today. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Told him one thing, don't eat of that tree. Seems to me that would have been the most simplest thing in the world. But I was in the garden and I'd have probably ate of it too. I don't know. But anyway, what, what does it say? And when the woman, remember, God gave the, the directions to him, gave the information to, to the man and the woman, or to the man, and uh, he, he conveyed the information to the woman. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for, eat, for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and her husband said, spit that thing out. That's funny, but that's not a joke. What should have, that's what he should have done. Amen. See? That's what he should have done. But what did he do? <laughs> got him one, got him some, and ate them too. Now, let me ask you a question. Who was the spiritual leader there? Who was the spiritual leader? Somebody said the serpent. Between Adam and Eve, Eve led the charge. She got some, ate it, gave some to Adam, and what did he do? He ate it too. Who was the leader there? My, my understanding of that verse, she did. She was the leader in that verse. That's what I think. That's what I think the verse says, you see. They... Uh, now, turn with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. No, wait a minute. Before you go there, go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. As a result of them eating that, something happened. God did something, didn't he? Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 says... Uh, Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. In sorrow, one of the curses, old woman, because Eve ate of that, according to that verse, is what? Childbirth is a lot of sorrow. Sorrow and pain involved in it. You see that in the verse? You see it? You ever wonder about that? Now you know why it, why it is. Because God put a curse on one. Because in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and there's two things, two curses. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Over thee. You see that? Two things as a result of them eating that stuff. And he said unto Adam, Adam, because thou hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Because you listen to your wife in that situation. It's, I better not add to it. And hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of the, thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou t uh, taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So there was, there was two curses given to Eve and one to Adam. What was Adam's? Get to it, guy. You got to go to work. That's what Adam. That's what. That's what uh, God told him to do. You see, and I believe going going to work, man, is serving the Lord. Going to work, serving the Lord. That's what he's told us to do, to be that main provider, I believe. Now, does God think going to work and being that provider is important? Well, there's a verse. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to have to just cut to the chase. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says that Someone that doesn't do that, you know what that verse says they are? They're worse than an infidel. If you're not providing for your family, God says you're worse than an infidel. 
Now, that's not talking about someone disabled or someone's retired. It's talking about someone that's able to work but won't work. Okay? Just get that straight. Worse than an infidel. You know what 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says in regards to that? It says, if a man won't work, what? Neither should he eat. Is that important to God? Yes, it is. And it should be important to us, to you. Young ladies, you, that, maybe that should be one of your priorities as you're out there uh, considering a husband. Okay? Now, I believe that headship, that leadership in a home, the main, God's main issue there is to be that spiritual head. To be that spiritual head of that family. To guide them spiritually. Adam failed in that respect in the garden. So, Adam, so God said, hey, we're going to do it this way. And I, I, I think that's what that is, you know. Uh, and that, that, that husband is to be that leader in that family. For the, he's to protect that family. And most importantly, I believe he's to be that spiritual head to lead them and guide them. Now, there's always problems. I shouldn't say always. There's often problems in a marriage. You know why that is? Because there's two sin natures under that same roof, and it's a man and a woman. And they think differently, don't we? We already talked about that. So there, there's going to be problems, and part of those problems often are what? Power struggles. You're going to be power struggles in your home. And if there's two of you, and then you said, well, we're just going to have kids, and that'll fix our problem. <laughs> We got three boys, and I don't think it fixed our problem as far as that part of it, because there's going to be problems in the home. Now, you know what causes problems? You know what Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10 says? I'm going to just start talking to the bastards because we're not going to have time. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 10 says, only by pride cometh contention. And you think about that. Only by pride cometh contention. So if, if you're having some contention, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. It works for me. <laughs> See? You know, what, you know what contention is? Contention is that inordinate, I'm sorry, pride is that inordinate, inordinate self-esteem, unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority. That's what pride is. I, mean, I just say it like this, man, you think too much of yourself. That's what pride is. That's what it is. And that's what causes contention in a marriage, according to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. Contention is just strife, struggles, quarreling, you know, and, and all that kind of business. You get in that, and well, what's the problem? Pride. It's sin. That three-letter word. See, that's what pride, pride is sin. Think it too highly of yourself. Now, grace is all that God is able to do for me because of Calvary. Grace is that unmerited favor. In a marriage, grace is a lifestyle. And it's opposite of the law. In a grace married lifestyle, you shouldn't have to earn favor from your spouse. See? Because you've already got that through grace in your marriage. If you're having to earn favor in order to get good deeds from your spouse, you're going about it all wrong. Okay? You've gotten your marriage under a law program of the Old Testament. That if-then principle. If you do this, if you do this, then I'll do that. Don't do that. It's not a good thing. See? It's, but rather it's grace... Because of what Christ did for me, I can now serve my spouse, can serve each other. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, submitting yourselves. What's that second word? That second word is yourselves. See? Submission has to be voluntarily by the submitter. You can't force someone to submit. And you shouldn't try. The, the Bible says submitting yourself is something that you know you're supposed to do, so you go ahead and do it, see? 
Just don't do that. Look at one more verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Let's, let's turn to that quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. I want to read that and the rest we're just going to have to go through here. Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, and that Satan tempt you not for your incontency. Incontency. Now, the only thing I'm going to say about that is don't do that. It's not healthy. Satan will tempt you. Just don't. God says don't do that, okay? Now, there's going to be different agreements in a marriage. We talked about before. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, Ephesians 5, 25. Look at that real, real quick. I want to... Look at something. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And as we, we, we look down, keep on going down through there, I want to look in at verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be... Well, that's not verse 1. Verse uh, 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blandness. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now you need to read that verse over about ten times and, and think on that verse. It's as though when you're speaking to your spouse or your wife, your husband, whoever it might be, that you're talking to yourself. Did you ever think about that? Did you, you know, you've said some things to your wife that you would never say to anybody else. Some mean, hateful things. Mean, you've said mean things to your spouse that you would never think of saying to anybody else. May I say, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not a good thing to do, see? Just don't do that. Now, the, the mystery in that passage there is the comparison of marriage to Christ and the church. Okay? I got to get going here. Now, Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. We've got to look at this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19 says, Husband, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Why would he tell you, husband, not to be bitter against your wife? Because there's, there's probably the possibility, the tendency that you might. And you know how bitterness develops? It's through not applying unforgiveness. When you don't forgive someone, whoever it is, and then you go to bed without issue, giving the forgiveness, and the next day, and then something else happens. And then in the afternoon, some, and you know what you're doing? Whether you know it or not, you begin to add that stuff up. You begin to add the stuff up where you should have been doing what? Forgiving. That's why you're not to go to, to, to go to bed and go to sleep without using the forgiveness that we're, that we're instructed and commanded to do. It's, it's, it's so very important. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. I just want to touch on don't have time to do a whole lot here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Do you use that verse as a club with your children? May I suggest that you not do that? May I suggest you teach your children that verse... That your parents are your protector. 
God gave you parents, children, to, to, to look after you, to protect you, to take care of you. See, that's how you're supposed to use that verse, as protection, not as a, what are you doing? You, God said you better listen to me. That really don't work. I've tried it. It, it don't work. It don't work. They, your children need to know that God gave you as parents to take care of them, to protect them, to teach them the word of God. And that's what that verse is for. Not as a club. Don't use it as a club. Just don't do that. Okay? Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And as, as, as the kids begin to go into adulthood. In verse 4, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Apparently, there's a, t- a tendency for fathers to provoke our children to wrath. And, there, and there's the warning there, don't do that. And the reason in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 20, 21 says that if you do that, you can discourage and will discourage your children. Fathers, God says be careful and not to provoke your children to wrath. It's not a good thing. Okay? It's just not a good thing. Don't do that. Now, your marriage, your family, your home life needs to be continually grace-oiled with grace, with these things that we're reading about here. It's not a one-shot deal. It's not something you do one time and you're done and you got it. I watched this... uh, Special on TV about this big steamship. It traveled up and down the, the Mississippi River. And they had one guy on that ship, at least one, all the time. You know what he did continually? 24 hours a day? Oiled and greased the moving parts on that ship. That's all he did. At least one. Continually. Because if there's a breakdown in one area on that ship, it could wreck the whole thing. Your family needs a continual oiling, a continual dose of grace in every area of the life. And we don't have time to talk about everything, but you need to do that. You need to understand these verses and allow Christ to do that. Now, as you do that, as you're allowing grace to work in your family, with your spouse, with your children... Then that moves into the local assembly. And the same thing there. And you can display the grace and the kindness that you have in your family. Because otherwise, you don't want to display the opposite. You don't want, to go, go, don't want them to that if-then principle in your family and in your local assembly. But it starts in your home. It starts in your home. That's where it starts. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Now, this next passage is uh, one of my favorite passages. It seems like whatever I teach on, I get, to re- I get to this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 through f- verse 32, I think is an extremely good passage. Especially for the home, especially for marriage. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You think that's a good idea for a home? Everything that you say is going to minister grace to the hearer. Man, that's a good idea all the time, ain't it? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. How do you do that? (coughs) Read the next verse. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Father God, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be here and to share some of these things with, with the saints. We're grateful that... We have this conference and a place that we can come and be edified and lifted up in your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.